The following is a listener-supported ministry from the Grace Evangelical Society. When we believe for the gift of eternal salvation, are we believing that our sins are forgiven or that the gift is given? Is forgiveness of sin and justification of the believer the same thing? How many things happen at the point of saving faith? We will think about these things today on Grace in Focus, and we are so glad that you are with us. This is the radio broadcast and podcast ministry of the Grace Evangelical Society. We are located in North Texas, and you can find out more about us by going to our website, faithalone.org. We also produce YouTube videos Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, and you can find them at the Grace Evangelical Society's YouTube channel. Once again, our website is faithalone.org. Now with today's question and answer discussion, Here are Bob Wilkin and Ken Yates. Bob, Jordan asked a question dealing with Romans chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. And I got to tell you, this is an issue that I am running into more and more. And I know we've talked about it. I think we've even talked about it on, on some of our podcasts here. But it's dealing with the forgiveness of sins. And, yeah, this comes up a lot. Oh, it's it's huge. In fact, in his question, he mentions you and me talking about forgiveness and how it relates to positional forgiveness and that you and I have both mentioned that forgiveness of sins deals with fellowship uh, with God. Uh, But most people within Christianity, I don't know if they would word it like this, but they equate the forgiveness of sins with being saved from hell. Right, Uh, And this is where positional forgiveness comes into play, part of it, that when I believe in Jesus— I'm saved from hell because all of my sins have been forgiven. Positionally, I, I'm uh, past, present, future, all my sins are forgiven. And that's why I can go to heaven when I die or be in the kingdom or something like that. And some people will use that as a substitute for everlasting life or irrevocable salvation. They'll say, oh, no, you don't need to believe you get irrevocable salvation or everlasting life. Just believe that all your sins are forgiven. Right. Even though I've met people, and maybe you have too, who believe all their sins are forgiven, but in order for that to continue, they must sure. stay in the faith. Yeah, you and, can give that back or whatever. Right. Yeah, forgiveness, if you sin too big, you can lose it or, or whatever. That forgiveness can be, what would we say, negated or something? I don't think they think it through, but yes, you're right. That's the Or way even they if they say the forgiveness is not negated, they would see what we see, that forgiveness is not the same as everlasting life. Right. So you could have forgiveness of your sins and still go to hell. Right. And so Jordan here, he says in this question, and this, here's where you get down to the question. He says there is one passage, however, that equates forgiveness of sins with justification and, and this is his word, by extension, everlasting life. Yeah. He says this passage equates forgiveness of sins with receiving everlasting life. And, and the passage is Romans 4 verses six through eight, and it's talking about David. And Paul uses David as an example here, and he says, I'm going to read verse six, just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. And then he quotes from Psalm 32, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. And what Jordan's point here is, is that Paul is talking about justification by faith in this section of Romans, and he uses David as an example. And David said, blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute sin. Right. And whose sins are forgiven. He says this is a passage that equates then justification and therefore eternal life with forgiveness of sins. That's his right. point. And so he he wants us to address that. So the first thing that I would point out is it's an interesting passage that 
Paul uses with David here. It comes from Psalm 32. Right. And Psalm 32, most people believe, is David dealing with his sin of what he did with Bathsheba and Uriah when he committed murder and he committed adultery. Right. It's here when he says, blessed is the man to whom he does not impute sin. Right. Blessed is the man whose sins are forgiven. The reason I find that interesting is I'm assuming Jordan would agree with what I'm about to say, that when David wrote Psalm 32, he'd been a believer for a while. Right. So he already had eternal life. Right. And knew it. And knew it. And so here he is talking about after he was a believer, he sins grievously. Right. And he says, blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute sin and the man to whom sins are forgiven. It would seem to me that the sins that are being forgiven here in Psalm 32 are post salvation sins. Okay, now, Ken, this raises a good question, and I'm right with you. I agree with you. In fact, I'm looking at Psalm 32 right now, and he's talking about himself as a believer and having his sins as a believer covered and forgiven. And he goes on to say, when I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all day long. In other words, he wasn't forgiven during that time when he kept silent, right? Right. When David wasn't confessing his sins to God, he went through a year of pain and suffering until Nathan the prophet comes to him and says, you're the man. And then he confesses, I've sinned against God. Now, it's funny, he sinned against Uriah and Bathsheba, too. Right. But he sees ultimately his sin is against God, right? Right. And that's the right attitude. Ultimately, although we sin against people... The biggest offense is against God himself, because God has called us to love one another, not to hurt one another, not to kill one another, not to commit adultery. So in all these things, I'm with you. So here's my question. Going back to Romans 4, I see why he uses Abraham in verses 1 through 4. Absolutely. Why does he even use this quote from David then? Why does, is it legitimate for Paul to use, I mean, obviously it is, I'm using that in a rhetorical sense, but why does he use it here? Please plan to join us at Camp Copus in Denton, Texas. The Grace Evangelical Society's 2024 National Conference is May the 20th through the 23rd good fun, wonderful fellowship, recreational opportunities for the younger ones and the older ones, great teaching on the theme of free grace in the epistles of Peter. There's VBS for kids too. More information and online registration now at faithalone.org slash events. That's faithalone.org slash events. Please come and join us. Yeah, if you're going to argue that as Jordan is suggesting that David is used as a person who receives eternal life because his sins are forgiven. It's very strange that he would use Psalm 32 for that purpose. That's your point as well. Right. I know we've talked about this. I don't know if you remember, both of us are getting up in our years and we may forget (laughs) when we do this. But I mentioned to you probably about a year ago that I wonder if what he's doing, Paul is doing is here, right after he talks about David, he goes into the section of Romans 5, 6, 7, and 8, where he talks about Christian living. Right. And so he's transitioning. Okay, yes, you, you're justified by faith. Abraham, at the moment of faith, you're justified. But what does that mean for the justified believer? And David would be a great example of, okay, what does it mean now that I'm a believer and I sin like David did with Uriah and Bathsheba? And so this is, he's moving into the forgiveness of sins that the believer enjoys. I think that could be right. Now, one of the things I've argued elsewhere is verse 25 says that Jesus was delivered, Romans 4, 25, he was delivered up because of our offenses and he was raised because of our justification. That's not the word justification. That's the word righteous living. Exactly. Dikaioma right. or dikaiosis. I believe it's dikaioma here. Very rare word. Very rare there. word. Right. And the point is, I'm convinced that is a transition into chapter five. But I wonder if everything starting in verse six all the way to the end of the chapter might be transitional. In any regard, I would say the only reason David can say what he says in Psalm 32 those opening verses quoted here in verses 7 and 8, is because he knows he's already justified by faith. In other words, Paul can legitimately say this 
because David would not be able to say this if he did not believe he was already justified by faith before the Lord. Well, that's a great point, and I agree with you. I do think there's this transitioning, and I think that's missed by most people. In fact, when I was teaching Romans before, I missed it. I always just saw, like Jordan did, that David is just repeating Abraham's experience. But in Psalm 32, that doesn't seem to be the case at all. And I think your point about verse 25 is spot on, that he's making this transition. Yeah, and look, if some of you are Bible college or seminary students— and you're writing a thesis or a dissertation, this would be a great topic, oh, well, right? By the way, also in this question by Jordan, he's equating justification, forgiveness of sins, and eternal life as all the same here. But what we're saying is they're not the same thing. Okay, let's do a quick thing on justification and eternal life. They do both occur at the moment of faith. Exactly. But they're not the same. They're not the same. And they're not even the same work of the Godhead. For example... Regeneration is done by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit regenerates us. But justification seems to be, at the very least, a work of God the Father. He declares us righteous. God the Father does. Now, there seem to be a few other verses that may suggest this is also a work of God the Holy Spirit. But that's another good topic for discussion. Is (laughs) justification only a work of God the Father? But the point is, justification is to be declared righteous, to be regenerated, is to be given everlasting life. Well, we're given everlasting life at the moment of faith, and we're declared righteous in our position at the moment of faith, but those are two separate things. Chafer had 33 things that happen at the moment of faith. We become part of God's family. We become a child of God, John 1, 12 and 13. There's lots of things that happen at the moment of faith, But the question is, what is it that is the bullseye? And the bullseye is that I have everlasting life. Now, I think you could hypothetically make the bullseye that I've been declared righteous forever, but the Lord doesn't do that in the Gospel of John. Yeah, and so when we deal with this third element, which is the forgiveness of sins, how are we going to word this? The use of David, what is Paul's point here? Yes. Okay, so he's a justified believer, and now his sins are covered sin with Bathsheba and Uriah. Is it too simplistic to simply say, okay, as a justified believer, someone who has eternal life, those are not the same thing. Right. I have access to God and now my sins can be forgiven as I approach him, as I confess these sins to him or something yeah. like that. And that's a blessing. Yes. But the blessing <laughs> presupposes justification by faith. Exactly. Alone. And I, I'm yeah. good with that. Yeah. By the way, y'all can, and I believe your daughter, Catherine, are writing a book on the forgiveness of sins, and I'm looking forward to seeing it. Well, this was an outstanding question. We hope that in this short period of time that we give you some food for thought. Until next time, keep keep grace grace in focus. focus. Be sure to check out our daily blogs at faithalone.org. They are short and full of great teaching, just like what you've heard today. Find them at faithalone.org slash resources slash blog. We would love to hear from you. Maybe you've got a question, comment, or some feedback. If you do, please don't hesitate to send us a message. Here's our email address. It's radio at faithalone.org. That's radio at faithalone.org. And when you do, very important, please let us know your radio station call letters and the city of your location. On our next episode... Is there any difference between believing in Jesus and believing on Jesus? Hope you will join us. Until then, let's keep grace in focus. The proceeding has been a listener-supported ministry from the Grace Evangelical Society.